There's the bell. Soccer is in session. I'm your host, Jason Longshore. Thanks for joining us for this new show on the Soccer Down Here Network, covering soccer in Georgia schools, high school and college. In the spring, we're going to cover all the high school programs as they get started with games kicking off next week. Official games that count their scrimmages and preseason games this week. But official games start next week. We're also going to have live game coverage on the SDH app on SoccerDownHere.net. In the fall, we're going to talk about all of the college programs going on around the state, from the D1s all the way down to the JUCOs, everything in between statewide. That's what we're going to do on Soccer is in Session. It's a year-round process. High school kids committing to go play in college. High school kids going on to play college out of state. College programs participating in spring games. Some college programs will be playing professional teams in in scrimmages and preseason games. It's a year-round, all-encompassing thing, and we're going to talk about all of it on Soccer is in Session. But we don't get to do this if we don't have some support, and we are very lucky to have our good friends at Kaiser Permanente presenting this show and all of our high school game coverage to you all season long. Kaiser Permanente covers the state of Georgia. We cover soccer in schools in the state of Georgia. It's a perfect fit, isn't it? Thank you to everybody at Kaiser Permanente for supporting Soccer is in Session. Now let's get into this spring high school season. It's going to be a crowded calendar as anybody who's played high school soccer in the state of Georgia or coached or had kids who played. It is a lot of action in a short period of time. Teams have just finished their tryouts. This is a week where they can play some preseason game scrimmages. Some teams do intra-squad scrimmages. Some teams are playing other teams. But the first week for official matches starts with the week of January 30th. We're going to have our first game coverage on January 31st. Stay tuned to Soccer Down Here on your social network platforms to find out where we'll be. The state tournament will start April 11th, and the finals will be May 2nd through the 5th at McEachern and at Mercer, the two sites that we saw last year. Don't know which regions are going to be where just yet or which classifications are going to be where just yet. We'll find that out as we go. Uh, Excited to be on the call for those once again for NFHS. Uh, I've been doing that since 2017, and it is honestly one of the highlights of my year. Every year, getting to call games for Atlanta United is amazing. But getting the opportunity to tell the story of these high school state championship games is it's incredibly rewarding. Um, I played high school soccer in the state of Georgia in the mid '90s. That was about as high of a level as as you could get in some parts of the state. We didn't have a a huge uh, select program at that time in Henry County, and I played at Eagles Landing and Eagles Landing Public. And we had uh, big games that I'll always remember. More than the the youth games that I had, I'll remember when we played Stockbridge with uh, about a thousand people there, and it was a big rivalry game. And I'll remember when we went to Marist and and won at Marist and won at Westminster. And I'll remember the losing to to Woodward in the final round of the region playoffs and and the state tournament. Um, it was it's memories that stick with me. And I think that's something about high school soccer that is so different than the the youth club game. And they're both incredibly important, but the memories made in high school soccer are special. And I know over the years there's been the huge conversation about uh, the the DA and, and kids not playing in high school and and this and that. I think there's always different situations for kids who have a professional pathway and and they probably need to be in those professional training sessions as opposed to playing in a high school game. I get that. It's not the same pathway for every kid. But high school soccer has incredible value to the participants, to the families, to the coaches, to the communities. And we're excited to help tell that story and put a spotlight on it. And it just it's something that the game, the two games that I'll remember – for example, in 2022, that are two of the best games I called at 
any level, whether it was college, whether it was uh, summer league, whether it was USL championship, whether it was MLS. Two of the games that I will always remember from 2022 were high school games. Uh, one was a game we did on the Soccer Down Here Network in Gainesville when Johnson hosted Dalton. One of the wildest, craziest games. Great atmosphere, great crowd. I'm excited to go back to Johnson on February 10th as they'll host Gainesville. That'll be one of our featured games on Soccer Down Here. But that game, uh, just back and forth, great goals in it. It, it was a, an amazing regular season game between two of the top programs in the state. Uh, one went on to win a state championship. One lost in the state championship match. The other game was the single-A public girls state championship game down at Mercer. Social Circle beat Commerce in overtime. And what a game. Incredible talent from both of those teams. Uh, ex expecting to probably see them again in 2023, making a deep run into the state tournament. But just Two great games, and I say this all the time on all the different platforms that I'm on. I love the game at all levels, and I enjoy the game at all levels. There's no reason why a high school game like that one, Single A Public, Social Circle Commerce, can't be as enjoyable, as emotional, as wild of a ride, as much fun as a big game national team game or a major league soccer game. So if you have an opportunity to go see a game in your community, go see a high school game, go support the local program, go back to the, the school that you graduated from. If you get a chance to do that this season, I highly recommend giving it a shot. Of course, not every game is the greatest game in the world. It happens at all levels too. But you never know what you're going to see. That's what's so amazing about this sport is the ball rolls out, and you never know exactly what you're going to get. It could be just an amazing game. There could be an amazing player you see for the first time. It could be an amazing goal, an amazing save, a great defensive play. That's what's so great about this game. And, and please, if you get a chance, go out and see these high school programs in the spring. And same goes for the college programs in the fall. So... That's the calendar. That's kind of why we're doing this. So let's talk a little bit in this first segment about the defending state champions. Uh, lots of classifications in Georgia high school soccer. A lot more than when I was playing. Uh, you have single A, public, and private all the way up through 7A last year. And you had one school that ended up doing the double, winning both the boys and the girls state championships. But you had a number of them that were close. And those are the ones I wanted to feature today. Love it and Pace nearly pulled off the double. That was the state championship game in 2A on the boys and the girls' side. They split it. Love it won the girls' title. Pace won the boys' title. Greater Atlanta Christian, they won the boys' title in 3A. They made it to the girls' state championship game, but they lost in that match to Westminster in the 3A girls' final. Blessed Trinity took both of their teams, boys and girls, to the 5A semifinals. They fell at that stage in both games, didn't get to the final. Uh, Bremen did the same in 2A. Northwest Whitfield, their boys got to the 4A state championship game. They lost to their rivals, Southeast Whitfield, another great game that I had a chance to call in 2022. The Northwest Whitfield girls made the state the state semifinals as well. Oconee County did that in 3A. Athens Academy did that in single-A private. Pinecrest Academy won the single-A private title on the girls' side. The boys got to the semifinals but fell short. The one school in the state of Georgia that did the double, that won the boys' and the girls' state championships, Lassiter High School. Uh, had a chance to call those games for NFHS, both of them, and... What a program. Incredible work by Lassiter. And they will go into 2023 with that target on their back on both sides, on both programs, the boys and the girls, defending state champions. Just so hard to do. I know it's happened in the past as well, but in 2022, only Lassiter was able to pull that off. Make sure you're following the great Georgia high school soccer, all no spaces in between. Georgia High School Soccer, make sure you're following that account on Instagram. 
They announced their preseason all-state teams for all classifications this week. That is a must-follow. If you're going to listen to this show and you're going to follow high school soccer in the state of Georgia, make sure you're following Georgia High School Soccer on Instagram. Also, if you're on Twitter, uh, there is a Georgia High School Soccer account. I actually don't know if they're related. Uh, I I don't think they are. Um, if they do, maybe they need to team up. Um, there's also a list that I've created on, on my Twitter account of active Georgia high school soccer accounts. I think I've got most everybody. I know there's some that I've missed. You can follow that list. And if I'm missing your school, please let me know. Follow me on, on social media, on Twitter specifically, at Longshoe. I'll get you added to that list and I'm going to try to share some of the, the stories and things throughout the season from that list on my social media. But you can follow that list if you're on Twitter. Just go into my account and lists, and it's Georgia High School Soccer. Uh, also, if you have news to publicize, please let me know. You can find me on any social media platform at Longshoe. Uh, my email's connected there as well. Just let me know so I can blast out here through this show through soccer down here, and anything else I'm doing, just so I, I, I keep up with it. I try to pay attention to everything going on around the state. Things get a little busy from time to time, and I don't always see everything. So please let me know if you have news to publicize so I can try to drop it in wherever I can. We do have an interview on our first show, and it's a friend of the network, John Aiken, head coach at Oglethorpe University D3 Men's Soccer Program. Uh, John's one of my favorite people to talk soccer with, and, and we uh, ended up talking for a long time. <laughs> uh, you're not going to hear all of that. Uh, I'm sure you're going to hear some of those things pop up over, over the next few months on the show. But we had a chance to talk about what a spring season is from a college program perspective and then what the recruiting process is like for a college coach. What are they looking for? What are the things that he notices about a player and some advice for kids and parents out there who are part of that process. Now, when we come back, John Aiken from Oglethorpe University right after this on Soccer is in Session. Attention high school sports fans, are you an armchair official? You know, the parent or fan who constantly yells at the referees and loves to let everyone know just how bad you think they are. Well, if you think you could do better, then get in the game and prove it. It's time for you to suit up and make the calls where they actually count. Every sport in Georgia needs more officials. Sign up today at highschoolofficials.com. Welcome back to Soccer is in Session with one of our longtime guests on Soccer Down Here. So it's kind of perfect to kick off our guest appearances on Soccer's in Session with Oglethorpe coach John Aiken. How's it going, John? Very, very well. Thanks for having me. Love being here. Yeah, I think you're one of our, our most frequent guests on Soccer Down Here. So, of course, we've got to start the Soccer in Schools conversation with you and First off, let's just let's talk about the fall at Oglethorpe. What was the season like for you? You know, if you had some time to reflect now, you know, how did everything go? Um, you know, for for our standards, we've we underachieved. You know, we we were five, six, and five in our five, five, and five in the regular season. Um, a really defining uh, moment for us was the the rule change for um, the NCAA that that uh, put into place no overtimes in college soccer. So a lot of teams that, you know, weren't maybe as strong as us only have to defend us for 90 minutes. And, you know, without having a real clinical finisher in the team this year um, or without finishing very well comprehensively as a team, you know, we didn't get that goal in the 90 minutes. And it's not going to the extra 20 minutes where you've worn a team down through possession or whatever else. And you can, you know, put that goal away and, and show who the stronger teams were. So, uh you know, it was it was disappointing that we we didn't uh, win a championship this year. But sometimes those are great moments to reset as a program and think about, you know, why you didn't. Um, and and we we dug in pretty pretty deep this <laughs> this season to reflect this off season as to you know where our needs are player wise, 
um, culture wise? Uh, what are some other things? Because the rule change isn't going to, um, you know, that that that's in place for at least a couple years. Um, uh, there's a lot of dismay. You know, I think Williams went all the way to uh, in the regular season with 10 ties and got in the NCAA tournament. So there's some wacky stuff happening with that. And, and I don't want to. Um, I don't want to, you know, that's not going to define us. We've got to find the answers outside of that rule, and then we'll we'll come back stronger uh, this season. It's interesting getting a chance to call a number of different schools in the fall and how sometimes there's overlap and, like, the story feels the same. You guys <laughs> and Georgia State's women, it always felt like it was so close to breaking. You know, if you get one goal here, one goal there, a little bit of momentum, pick up a result, start to get on a roll. And, and it just felt like I had the same conversation with you and Ed Joyce all year about it's right there. We just need a couple more goals. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the way it happens. You know, uh, 2010, we were a very strong team. Uh, I think we, we were in the end of the season, six, 10 and one of our nine losses. They were by, they were by one goal. And in those eight of those nine losses, we outshot our opponent by more than 12 shots. So, you know, the next year we turn around and go 17 and two and, uh, you know, break, break the school record for wins, NCAA tournament for the first time. So, you know, we're not going to really change outside of a few tweaks with regards to philosophy and, and, and what type of player we're bringing in. So hopefully, you know, the challenges we face this year, we, we can build on those and, you know, maybe, maybe get rolling next season. You mentioned reflecting and, and preparing, looking ahead. You've got a spring, you know, kind of season coming up. And this has always been something that I think people on the outside maybe look at and say, what do schools try to accomplish in the spring season? I, I put air quotes on season because it, you're not playing games that count, but they can be really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the biggest thing, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I, I would say the, the feeling for most colleges is individual uh skill development, um, strength and conditioning, you can spend a lot more time on, you can tax the body a lot more because you're not taxing the body with, you know, the extensive travel and the 90 minute games and the, you know, the 18 games in a two month span. So you can really, um, help develop those players as athletes, uh, as well as, you know, a lot of our, in, you know, skill sessions in the summer are really, Hey, what role do these players play? What are the technical skills needed at these positions? And let's just get after it and do it again and again and again. So hopefully by the time, you know, they roll around, you know, three or four months later when it counts, you know, it's it's a, a natural, more innate thing for these guys to to do in those critical moments. How does a, a schedule come together for you at this point? I mean, you've been around doing this for a long time, so I'm sure you've got plenty of connections and trading games off, but what do you try to accomplish with that? And how does that come together? Yeah. I mean that, that for, for us specifically, and this is another rule change, um, you know, division three is only allowed uh, 16 training, 15 training dates and one playing day. Oh, wow. Um, division one, and division two have more extensive springs, but they're still limited relative to what everybody's allowed to do in the fall. In the fall, we're all, all, all allowed to do the same thing. Okay. Um, the NCAA just passed uh, a week ago or two weeks ago that we're going from 16 training sessions to 24 training sessions, which gives us another two weeks, which is great. Yeah. So we'll just continue that skill development, that physical development, um, becoming a better athlete, becoming a better soccer player. Um, when I first started, I'm on year 21. My first five years, we were allowed five playing dates, yeah. uh, the same that uh, Division One, Division Two were. But now we're we're down to one playing date. So, you know, we do a lot of internal team uh, competitive uh, things. So when the kids get back to school, you know, we've got a January term. Um, so we're, we're in that block now. January 1st starts our spring semester. So we'll we'll lift weights for about five or six weeks. The guys will be playing on their own. Um, once spring break hits, we come together as a team after that week, and then we go until you know the sem end of the semester. So uh, that's kind of the the layout as it is now. It'll look a little different next year by probably you know you know getting two weeks of preparation before spring break, um, and then the kids will go away and probably have a, a little bit of fun or something. So <laughs> we don't we don't throw away all that good work. <laughs> yeah, of course. The the landscape continues to to kind of change. And, and I know there's a lot more coming when it comes to, to D1 and the proposals about 
going to a year round kind of schedule. Um, what do you foresee just down the road uh, without taking two hours like we know we could here? Oh, yeah. Uh, so what do you kind of foresee in, coming? In, in a nutshell, um, what I've heard from my colleagues who are in, um, you know, power five division one roles, um, <clears throat> you know, that it's happening. The, the year round model is coming. However, not every division one setup is 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 going to go that route right i mean there, there's such a large discrepancies in between the haves and the have nots i mean even a i think the you know, this, somebody's going to probably correct me on this but I, I was told that georgia's athletic budget as a whole was 185 million and that's the national championship when it comes to college football stuff and then you've got an acc school that's no slouch either georgia tech that i think spends 80 or 90 million for their athletic budget which is you know just huge right but you've got those two things between the SEC champ and an ACC, you know, powerhouse in certain sports. And then you've got the other end of the spectrum that there's a lot of colleges that are closer to Division three models that that we may be better funded than than than, you know, the, the extreme there. So what I heard is that there is going to be a break in how Division one is set up and there's going to be a trickle down effect like, you know, the, the, the top end is you know, unlimited scholarships, do whatever you want, no rules, clearly defined by probably the, the big football conferences. Right. And then who aligns with them, right? And then everybody left over is going to decide what they've got to do. You know, um, like my guess is, you know, the Ivies, they don't offer athletic scholarships anyway. That's not going to change anything for them. They're not going to, their, their identity is not going to change. But what does everybody else do? And then how does that affect the, you know, the other divisions? And it's, it's going to be very, very interesting. And what I was told recently at a, a big showcase event was it's happening like within the next year or two at the latest. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if it would all align um, that quickly, but I think you, we will, you know, right now it's relatively hearsay outside of the people in these transformational committees, you know, at the top, but, I think the rest of us will know just about how it's going to go. Um, and then each school will have to define, you know, how they're going to do it moving forward, but it's, it's happening sooner rather than later. It, it just, it feels like such a different conversation about college sports as a whole. I mean, we've seen the NIL conversation on the football and the basketball side a lot. Are you seeing any of that in the, the college soccer world really having an effect? Um, certainly not you know, in the division three world, you know, I mean, o Oglethorpe, um, you know, it's been around 170 years or whatever, whatever, whatever it is. I should know that fact. But, you know, a lot a lot of the schools like us are like what colleges used to be, you know, yes. 100, 100 years ago. They were all, you know, I mean, a thousand, uh, you know, five thousand kids. And it was about going to school. And, hey, if you were you know good at sports, you could help elevate the brand. And then now you've got a semi pro business operating at the certainly at the college and basket football and basketball, the revenue generating sports. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, th I think they've just gone so far and the NIL deal, just, you know, added steroids to the situation. So um, you, you've got these schools there. They're not really, you know, led by what colleges are all really about. You know, I mean, that's a these are basically they're creating these fandoms um, that are funding. Um, and and I mean, you know, football and basketball, there's some great things. I mean, they're building science buildings and they're building other yeah, things, 100%. But, but that's not what colleges are meant to be about. So I, I think that the last hundred years, this has been coming. It's, it's been building up to this point. And I think the, uh, you know, the rules and, you know, the, the NCAA versus the big football schools and then the NIL deal to try to appease some of those things. I, I think it's going to be the breaking point. And I, and I think there's going to be a, you know, rebranding, if you will, about what, you know, 98% of colleges or 95% of colleges are going to be like and what motivates them to, you know, do what they do. And then they're going to, you know, the big football and basketball schools are going to do, you know, um, what they want to do. It's going to be interesting to see because not all college programs, you know, align with those, you know, the, the haves and have nots in football. There's some outliers there. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to to follow and, and the landscape of that combined with the landscape that we're seeing in the soccer world with, you know, more professional teams than ever before, not just the growth of MLS, but the lower divisions and 
we and the college game still has a very important place to play in that world in in preparing players for that next step and some of the late bloomers that don't go through the professional academies or aren't ready at 17 18 to sign a pro deal go through college and then become professional players and make a livelihood in it so there's a lot of overlapping parts here there are um it, it's exciting it's it's maddening it's uh it's a, <laughs> yeah. lot, a lot of a lot of those things at, at once and you know without being a decision maker in the process i've got to make some you know educated guesses as to how it's not going to really affect anything we do you know candidly you know we're we're you know putting a good product out there our kids are getting yeah. a great education we're competing to be our best selves and, and that's actually a comforting thing knowing that we're not going to change our identity but there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to have to rebrand they're going to have to re-identify with what their principles are and that that's a that's a scary thing yeah it's going to be a lot of change and it's something that, that we'll try to keep all of you kind of up to breast with when it comes to the the georgia schools and everything happening here now, one thing you can't control is recruiting, and that's you know, a constant thing, I'm assuming, at this point. You know, it felt like before there were certain periods where you'd go recruit, and that was it. Is it a year-round sort of thing now that you have to stay on top of? It, it is. You know, the old cliche that said, uh, recruiting's like shaving. If you take a day off, you can look bad. And <laughs> um, it's, it's true. It's, you know, because the, the reality is, you know, every kid and every family and every college coach has a different timeline. You know, college coaches, uh, you know, are people and they've got young kids and families and illnesses and, um, you know, normal work things outside of that. I mean, although recruiting is really the lifeblood of any any program, you know, those timelines don't always align, but you have to somehow make it work and keep up with it and, a kid thought he was going here and then he didn't get into a school. And then that, how does that change? And how does that kid go up your depth chart or, or not? Uh, you know, there are certain kids that um, due to injuries can't continue to play for you. Yeah. And, you know, how does that change? There's some needs that are constantly coming along. Um, there's transfers. The transfer portal has totally changed, you know, college athletics in, in general as well. And, so all of those things are constantly moving. So it, it is, it is at 365, they, you know, like, you know, process that we all just try to keep up with and do the best we can. So let's get to the beginning uh, of the process. When you are at you know, like a showcase event on, on the club side or you, you pop into a, a high school game and you're seeing a kid for the first time, what are the things that on the field you're looking for for your program? You've seen us play so many times. I, th I think the most important thing would be soccer IQ. You know, does this player understand the game? Is he, you know, getting looks over his shoulders? Is he linking play? I think that's a that's a starting point. Uh, it's easy to see the big, strong athletes, um, you know, and the big, strong, you know, monster athletes that have the unbelievable soccer IQs are probably already committed to Clemson <laughs> as a sophomore, right? Right. <laughs> So for us, uh, it's it's going after the player that has some sort of combination of that, and and you know, but but really, I'd like it's it's hard to teach a kid, you know, the the understanding and the sophistication of the way we play. Uh, it can be done, and it has been done. You know, we kind of plug some players in, and over time, they really absorb what we're trying to do. But I would say that's the first thing we look at, and then they have to be, you know, athletic enough. Um, yeah. or so soccer smart um, that, you know, they never get caught with the ball because everything's, you know, done before or after um, anybody even gets close to them. So uh, it's it's that combination that, that we go after, soccer IQ, athleticism. And then we start to go, oh, wow, this kid catches the eye. I really like what, you know, this guy has going on. Then it's the combination or the conversation with the coaching staff. What's he like as a person? What's he like as a player? Um, obviously, you know, for the higher end academic schools, it's what kind of grades do they have, you know, can they, can they survive, you know, our curriculum, are they going to be successful at our school? Um, if so, then we, you know, try to get after them right away and, you know, find out what they're going and get them in on visits. And we just go from there. You started with something that I think at times gets lost in the shuffle and, and maybe in other sports, it's not as big of a deal in the recruiting side, the fit to your program, the fit to the, your style of play, the way that, that your program plays. And 
look, not every college program has an, a, a, an, a big identity, a strong identity, and, and they might look for that great athlete or that player who's just a good player. You're looking for very specific things, and it kind of separates you a little bit from, from what some other schools might be doing. Yeah, I mean, if if you know, we're we're a program that's just like, hey, we're gonna make it a nightmare for other people and press like crazy and dump it over the top and live off other people's mistakes. You know, I would be going with for a few different players, but some of those players that can't survive in that because they're not built for that do extremely well with us, right? Um, and that's that's important. You know, what I encourage young players and their families to really do is, you know, especially. You know, it's, we're, we're a few year, years removed from, you know, Barcelona's dominance with possession and things like that. And the, and the game's evolving a little bit. But um, when that was going on, every coach in the country said, oh, we play, you know, we play great soccer and we combine. And, and you know, my rebuttal to that would be like, yeah, I mean, that's what you're telling him. But go watch their games. You know, right. Go watch a conference game. And, you know, the midfielders touch the ball like three times, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in, in 45 minutes, you know, so a lot of people say it. So, so I tell all the recruits, listen, I'm going to say that because I mean, I'm an honest guy and that's what, you know, we were about, but everybody's saying that, you know, so go watch them play. The proof is in the pudding, pudding when, you know, games on the line, you're two nil down, you know, um, or, or, or it's an important game and you need to, you know, get a result. What, what do you do? Do you change your identity or, and then, you know, building on that is how do you fit into that? You know, if you're a technical, um, you know, smaller type player, you know, what, what does the rest of their team look like? You might love that school and they're unbelievably successful, but it doesn't make sense to go there. You know, you might never play. And and I think, you know, the other thing that I would always say is go to a place where you're going to play. You're going to enjoy playing. You, you go to a school, you've worked so hard as a young person to develop your player and put yourself in a situation to get the opportunity to play college soccer, don't beat your head against a brick wall and and go somewhere where you're going to be on the end of the bench. I mean, it doesn't matter where you go; you should play. That's what really it's about. Yeah, I think the the positive for for parents and kids to understand is there are schools that can fit your game at, at a variety of different levels. You have more choices. It's not just about who comes knocking on your door at, at times. It's about picking what's best for you and. You have enough, you know, different styles of play now at the college level that you can find somewhere you'll fit in and you'll play and you'll enjoy your experience. Yeah, I'll give you a a funny story that literally happened yesterday. So we were down at the showcase down in Orlando or Sanford this weekend, my assistant Carter and I. So we have, I mean, you know, we're watching a ton of games. I mean, there's, you know, eight games in the eight o'clock time slot that we have to see. So we're bouncing around and whatever else. So we're taking quick notes and there's Good player from Florida that we uh, identify, get his team brochure, follow up with him literally yesterday, the day before. And we get a note back and said, coach, thank you so much for coming to my game. Um, I'm, I really looks like an impressive school, but I'm focused on division one and division two schools. We said, okay, great. Just out of curiosity, what are you looking at? And he said, well, my coach is trying to get in contact with FIU, FAU, University of North Florida, Florida Gulf Coast, Rollins College, University of Tampa College. I mean, this kid is a senior. He's got three months to go, and he has his brain locked on these schools. Um, and then he says his coach is trying to get in contact with them. That is not a good sign. And, you know, we, we left it. We're not going to badger a kid you know he's right. got his mind made up but that those are some of the misconceptions and and problems out there that that kids run into it's just not realistic if this far in the process you're just starting to communicate with somebody yeah it's uh it's all changed pretty fast o- over the years what other advice do you give to kids and and their parents who are in this process right now uh, start early Um, try to, you know, I I like to try to start out with, okay, what part of the country do you want to go to school in? You know, um, what are your academics like? Um, could you play there? And you could probably find out pretty quickly by communicating, you know, I mean, the internet's an amazing thing with everybody's information online, find out when they're doing an ID camp. Um, that's a great way to go to a campus, uh, get to know a staff, uh, see a lot of the, a lot of us bring our college players out there uh, as a reference point. 
um, you know, and you know, you you could be doing it as a freshman or sophomore, and that's probably not a fair comparison because you got a couple more years to grow. But it gives you an idea of you know, personality wise of a staff, um, a, co- a great chance to walk around a campus and see a campus. You know, you do that earlier, you start to identify what schools you might connect with. And then you can start to, hey, I could see myself going there. And then you've got to start that process about, coach, could I play here? Um, and then the coach or the, the, the assistants or whomever the, the dialogue is with can start to shape that conversation. And, and the earlier you do it, um, the earlier you're on people's radars, um, you, you can find out if eventually that, that may be a possibility. For people out there who are interested in learning more about your program, kind of what's the process for that? How can I get in touch? Yeah, just shoot us an email. I mean, it's that it's that simple. Um, hey, coach, uh, you know, I'd like to know if I'm in the part of the 23 or for seniors or 24 class and, you know, 25 class. I mean, we're getting contacted and I'm sure all schools are about, uh, you know, kids interested and some are very proactive some are very late and we try to speed that process up for those late in there but it's just it's that simple it's identifying that you have an interest there and we try to pay attention to hey i've applied to your school i just got accepted i would love to be a part of the team if i'm offered a roster spot um that that interest level shows us that you're serious and we're not going to waste our time um if you're somebody that we could see playing for us. So being proactive in communication is the best way to engage. And then from that you know, standpoint, you could find out if, if you're going to be able to be a part of a program or not. But yeah, we, we, we welcome any communication and we, we try to be uh, as upfront and honest with everybody as soon as we can. Uh, we need to see players play, whether it be video or or ID camps or a showcase or a high school game. Um, And we can't be everywhere. So that's why video is really important um, to maybe spark our interest or, or, you know, having their club or high school coaches communicate with us Um, because we, we've been around, I've been around certainly long enough to know a lot of the people out there. And um, a lot of these high school or club coaches have sent players that, that have played here. And those are usually good reference points as to, hey, this kid's very similar to him or and he did really well for you or, hey, he's not quite there yet, but he could turn into X. And those conversations go a long way. Georgia high school season starts next week officially. You've always been somebody that has a lot of of local guys coming in, not just from the metro area, but starting to pull some from all over the state. You know, are, are you going to be out, your, your staff going to be out checking out some of these programs? And some Absolutely. Of I mean, we, we, we love watching high school games. Um, there's a lot of, you know, certain players um, play different roles in, in high yeah. school than they do in the club. You know, clubs is its own, you know, beast. But, but there's a lot of, you know, cool things that come out of the high school soccer scene. And we, we support that. And we, we get out there and watch, you know, players play. So, yeah, we will, we will absolutely be out there. Um, you know, some kids we already have on our radar. Some we'll find out about by going to watch another kid and really find that interest. Some some coaches that we know really well, we have good relationships with a lot of the guys that have been around for a while. And some of them have shifted around a little bit. But uh, what, I think they had high school tryouts uh, last week or the week before, I think the week before. And um, so they've just really formed their team. You know, um, I mean, you've seen uh, one of our greats, two-time All-American Topher Marshall, didn't make Parkview's high school or um, Brookwood's high school until his senior year. Yeah. Um, or maybe it was like late his junior, he got moved up, but he was a JV kid and he was just a late bloomer. And um, that's how we picked him up because he could have gone a lot of places, but he was just a late guy and we saw him in high school. So um, it's, it's, it's exciting because – so many new kids pop up and we like starting that process as soon as we know about them. Awesome. Well, I'm sure I'm going to bump into you out there at some of these high school games this spring, and I will definitely be seeing you in the fall, but we'll be seeing you here on soccer's in session plenty between now and the start of your season. Thanks for taking some time for us today. Absolutely. Love being here. Thanks for having me, Jason. Have a great day. Why are interschool elastic sports called the last classroom of the day? Because they teach students important life lessons like teamwork, accountability, and perseverance. School sports are so much more than a game. They're about developing the whole person. That's why they're an essential part of every student's education. Encourage your student to participate in the last classroom of the day. 
Interscholastic Sports in Georgia. This message presented by the GHSA and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Welcome back to Soccer is in Session debut episode here on the SDH Network presented by Kaiser Permanente. We care, we advocate, we give, we thrive. And together, Kaiser Permanente and Soccer down here, we cover soccer in the state of Georgia. And right here, we cover soccer in the state of Georgia in the schools, high school and college. Thanks again to John Aiken from Oglethorpe University for chatting with me. There's a lot of change coming in college athletics. And look, we see it at the the big time side of things, whether we're talking football, basketball, We've seen some programs come and go at the lower levels. Locally, we saw Appalachian State drop men's soccer, which was a, a big shock, actually, a, a long-time program. You're going to see a lot more reorganization over these next few years as the landscape continues to change, and we'll try to keep you abreast of everything on the, the college soccer side of things here on Soccer's In Session uh, with John Aiken and our other friends all over the state in the college side of things. But this season in the spring, we're going to focus a lot on the high schools. Now, one area where you get this crossover, obviously, is the national letters of intent being signed. There's a, a lot of talk in the high school sports world about National Signing Day on the football side. Next week, they already had a National Signing Day. It's hard to keep up with it from time to time. You know John Nelson's going to keep you up to date with everything on Georgia Public Broadcasting. On the soccer side of things, just so you know, players could start signing National Letters of Intent back on November 9th. And a lot of players have signed, and a lot of programs around the state have really, you know, told you who's coming to school in the fall, but that process can go all the way up through August 1st for the fall season. So soccer is very different than, than football in this world, that you're going to see commitments happen really throughout that run. So from November 9th all the way up through the next August 1st, as you get into that fall season, commitments will happen and announcements will be made. In one this week, Jesse Lee of Mill Creek High School, he also plays in club at GSA's ECNL squad, uh, Jesse is committed to play in college at VMI, Virginia Military Institute, a uh, prestigious program. So congrats to, to Jesse. Congrats to everybody at Mill Creek. Uh, we will be seeing Mill Creek uh, hopefully later this season on the SDH Network. Uh, there's a great feature from an account you need to follow, Blitz Sports GA. Uh, great feature on the Lumpkin County Girls Squad. Last year, Lumpkin County went 16-4-1, and and they're returning almost all of their starters this year. They're looking to make a run in 3A Region 7. And keep an eye on the Lighthouse Sisters. Nicole and Andrea, they scored a combined, and it was almost split between the two of them, almost exactly, the Lighthouse Sisters scored a combined 45 goals and added 22 assists. That's a pretty good duo to build around for Lumpkin County. Uh, Don Brock, their head coach, said, We always aim to win the region and compete for a state title. This year will be no different. We have added some high-quality young players to the roster and plan to compete in each match. Might want to keep an eye on what's going on in Dahlonega and Lumpkin County. Make sure you're following Blitz Sports GA as well. I love to see the high school sports accounts focus on soccer a little bit more. I think it's easy to talk football. It's easy to talk basketball. I think baseball historically gets a lot of attention. Um, softball is getting more attention, which is great. High school soccer in the state of Georgia is growing massively. I love seeing the, the small local newspapers and the high school sports accounts start to pay more attention on the high school soccer side. And again, like I said earlier, if you're doing that and you want to get some extra extra reach, make sure you send it to me or make sure you tag me so we can talk about it here on Soccer's In Session, but also just help spread the word about the programs going on all over the state. 
I mentioned it on my Atlanta Soccer Tonight show on 92.9 The Game on Monday night, but great recognition of a great career. Carl Bostick, the legendary athletic director and coach at Parkview, will be inducted into two different halls of fame this year. In March, he's going into the Georgia Athletic Directors Association Hall of Fame, and in June, going into the Georgia Athletic Coaches Association Hall of Fame. On the athletic director side, 44 state titles during Bostick's tenure at Parkview. Uh, Won the GADA Director's Cup for the state's top athletic program in 2003 and 2005. On the coaching side, on the soccer side, five state championships, 1993, 94, 97, 98, and 2001. Finished state runner-up three times as the Parkview Panthers boys soccer coach. Final record for Carl Bostick at Parkview, 302 wins, 60 losses, five draws. Incredible work from Carl Bostick, and great to see him getting recognized in these halls of fame later this year. Congrats to Georgia State soccer alum Shevin Wilson for being selected to compete for Jamaica's women's national team at the 2023 Cup of Nations in Australia. The reggae girls are going to play between February 16th and 22nd. Four nations competing. Shevin Wilson, who also played at Clayton State as well, being part of the reggae girls for Jamaica. Very, very cool to see. Uh, If you're looking for an ID camp on the boys' side, keep Young Harris College in mind. Their men's soccer winter ID camp will take place on February 18th. That's a Saturday. Email assistant coach Francisco Costa for details and registration. F Costa, C-O-S-T-A, at Y-H-C dot E-D-U. And if you're an Atlanta United fan and also a Georgia high school soccer fan, and there's probably a whole lot of crossover in the listeners of this show, make sure you join us for the inaugural Georgia high school soccer night. All varsity and JV high school teams are invited to attend. This is at the home opener for Atlanta United, February 25th, as they host the San Jose Earthquakes. Kickoff will be at 7.30. The offer for this... To get tickets to this program for Georgia High School Soccer Night ends February 22nd. You need to reach out to Matthew Carter at matthew.carter at atlutd.com for more information. It's a limited time thing. Ticket prices start at $15 per seat. If you're a team and you want to sit together, the coaches have to reach out to Matthew to get that block and make sure you're all in the same area. There's also a purchase link available for any family and friends wishing to attend. Make sure you visit https colon backslash backslash f-e-v-o dot m-e slash g-h-s-a and enter the promo code g-h-s-a. Make sure you're following Soccer Down Here on all your social media platforms if you're not already. We will announce later this week where we will be for our first game broadcasts next week. The official start of Georgia high school soccer, the season, 2023, starts next week. First games could be scheduled on the 30th. We will be out on the 31st. And again, stay tuned to find out where we will be. We're going to try to cover a lot of games all over the state. We're going to try to catch up with coaches of the top programs. Hopefully you'll get to hear from some players as well. We're also going to talk about what the colleges are doing this spring as they get ready for their fall seasons. This is our new program on the SDH Network. Soccer is in session, presented by Kaiser Permanente. Thanks so much for checking us out the first time. We're coming back every Wednesday at 7 p.m. is when the show gets posted. Make sure you're subscribed to Soccer Down Here, wherever you get your podcasts. You can catch it there. You can also listen on the free Soccer Down Here app, which you can download in your app store, and you can check it out on SoccerDownHere.net. Thanks for hanging out with us. Mucha plata, y'all.